welcome everyone. Uh, I'm really excited uh, about uh, this evening and to, to look at Arno's work. Um, uh, I, uh, I spent some time on his website. He does very personal work as, as you will see. And it was, it was an incredible visual journey to kind of watch the, the, the uh, transition of his pictures over the years. If you go to his website, and I'm gonna put the link in the chat, you, you will see and kind of can experience that journey over the years yourself. And I highly recommend doing that. And Arno's gonna talk a lot about his, his work and his, his uh, process and, and all that stuff. And then you'll have questions that you can ask. Um, here is a, a bio. Uh, I had to edit this down because it's really so extensive. It's remarkable. Arno Raphael Minkinen is a Finnish American photographer, essayist, educator, and curator with over 100 solo shows and 200 group exhibitions at galleries and museums worldwide. He holds a Master of Fine Arts degree from RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, studying there with Harry Callahan and Aaron Siskind. His teaching career is extensive and began in Finland in 1974 at, uh, I cannot pronounce this uh, Finnish university's name, so please excuse me, uh, but it also includes many venerable schools and universities. He's currently Emeritus Professor of Art at the University of Massachusetts Lowell and docent at Alto University School of Art, Design and Architecture in Helsinki. Minkinen has a number of major monographs, too many to list, but his most recent is Minkinen, which won the German Photo Book Prize for Monograph of the Year in 2019 and 20, and the Honorary Book Award from the Finnish Book Jury Prize in 2021. His works are held in over 75 prominent museums and institutional collections worldwide. And again, they're too extensive to list them all, but they include the Musée d'Art Moderne and the Georges Pompidou Center in Paris, the Musée, uh, Musée de LSC in Lausanne, excuse my mispronunciation of French, the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, Major solo shows have recently also been held in contemporary art museums in Lima, Zagreb, and St. Petersburg, Russia. And he is also the recipient of numerous awards, including the National Endowment for the Arts Grant in 1991, and the 2000, 2013 Lucy Award for Outstanding Achievement in Fine Art, a 2015 John Simon Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, the Pro Finlandia Medal conferred by the President of Finland, and the 2019 Honored Educator Award from the Society of Photographic Education. That is quite something. And I will just kind of leave it there and say, please help me welcome Arno. Uh, take it away. Thank you, Peter. My name was born in Italy. My parents pulled Arno out of the river that flows through Florence. My father tacked on the Raphael to be my healer. Swimming at 1966 blood levels. Florence, Italy, 2016. Arno on the Arno. It was all done very quickly, a kind of shotgun baptism just before my first operation in case I didn't make it. Perhaps the water pouring over my head reminded them of the river. Truth was, my mother had wanted a girl so badly, she even had a name picked out for her unborn princess. But another boy it would be, and horror of horrors, the infant they placed in her waiting arms was no prince. When she laid eyes on me for the first time, as she writes in her autobiography, torn apart at the top lip with a bloody, gaping double cleft palate, 
she screamed. Vieja pois, take him away. Still, all that desire for a girl had to go somewhere. I like to think it flowed off on me. Why else does a man crave the loving tenderness of women all his life? Life as I knew it started on an operating table in Helsinki. Eyes barely six months old staring up at an ether ball dropping down from the hospital ceiling like the moon descending on earth in Lars von Trier's Melancholia. But I survived. Actually, life was coming to an end. That was it. My first conscious memory would be my last. But I survived. I spent nearly my whole first year in the hospital. I recall being tied by the wrist to the bedpost so I couldn't rip off the adhesive tape holding my mouth together. I remember how the nurses would surround the tub and smile down on me. Everything was white, the uniforms, the stiff sheets they tucked me under, the blinding ether ball, and the bloody white adhesive tape from the second operation. I even remember leaving the hospital and seeing the world for the first time out of the back of a limo's oval window, like the one in Dorothea Lange's funeral image. My mother and father didn't worry all that much. Later in boyhood, my mother told me, you don't need to go chasing after girls. God has a better plan for you, my father added. I would be a missionary, just like my grandfather had been in Japan. Those first visual memories became totally erotic in later life. I remember as a nine-year-old fantasizing about being in the care of beautiful nurses in starched white uniforms, scolded and spanked by them as much as showered with warmth and affection. The little girl on the left uh, is my mother. Uh, this is in 1916 uh, when uh, that part of Finland was uh, uh, still uh, belonged to Finland, now it belongs to Russia. She was a princess daughter herself and uh, they owned an island and forest uh, where they sold lumber, they had a general store, were very wealthy. Uh, she went on to become a nurse studying in Viipuri. Uh, and my father was born in Japan uh, to finish missionaries. He was unable to become a missionary himself because of the war. But he was in the Finnish cavalry. And uh, he uh, was the uh, patient of my mother who was the nurse. And it was a kind of Dr. Shivago love story. Uh, I have to go back. I'm, I'm nervous with the little finger button on this uh, keyboard. You could hear it in my voice, I think. This is when we bought our house. This is long after all the places where we've lived. Uh, this is in Andover, Massachusetts, and uh, we purchased it in 1987, and that's what it looked like. It was a kind of a, uh, a summer cottage. Uh, over the years, uh, and this talk is about 50 years. Um, I hope I can do it in 50 minutes. Um, but the, uh, the house now today uh, it looks out on this pond, which is like a lake. Uh, it faces the lake and there's a studio entrance on the left today. But during the period of time when we were, uh, I was away writing an essay for a book called Homework. Our carpenter called uh, my, uh, or came to fix the uh, bathroom and uh, in between were these newspapers to prevent us from uh, scratching and making noise that they used. And she called me in Finland and just said, you know, you won't believe what, he, what Lee found. This was some from 1939. Finns wipe out parachute army. Stalin concludes pact with red puppet in Finland, etc. 
why, after being 20 years in that house, are these papers in the bathroom floor? Um, so here you can see Finland on the right and, and, and that area where she lived right near St. Petersburg, Koivisto. Uh, oops. Uh, this is what it is today. Lake Lagoda, etc. all part of Russia. And we know what's going on these days. So it's a, it's a, it's a story that continues to be told. Uh, so my parents in, in 1951 got word that there was really going to be a problem with Russia. And, and my father had gone to America once to drum up some business. Uh, this wasn't a Russian bomb. This was a fire. But it represents the, the kind of bombing and explosions that they lived through uh, during the war. Uh, and so we, we, uh, we went to, we came to, to uh, uh, America. And uh, this was in 1951, uh, 4th of July. This picture is uh, of me in the center with my brothers. And it's, the, uh, it's in the uh, title, next to the title pages uh, in, the, in the new book uh, that um, uh, Peter and, 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 and uh, yeah, Peter mentioned. Um, and it says, uh, to Griffin, a granddaughter of Ellis Island. We got the book out just in time. Uh, so that she could be mentioned because we didn't know if she, was be, she wasn't yet born and they weren't going to give her a name and they didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. And so the publisher called and said, we've got to know. And uh, that very day we found out. So there she is now two and a half, name is Griffin. When we came to America, um, we came through you know, this uh, Hudson Bay, uh, Marizano Bridge wasn't there. I took this from an airplane long ago, but it contains the story of my life. It has Coney Island in it, uh, Bensonhurst, where we first moved for five years and you could see the parachute jump. Fintown, where, where I grew up, uh, became who I am. Bay Ridge, when I was in high school, and then Wagner College, where I went to study as a religion and philosophy major, still under the wings of my father. It also has the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. This is my father talking to me uh, at the uh, uh, apartment complex, which Fred Trump and company set up in Brooklyn, one of the first ones. Uh, we happen to be on the fourth floor above my head. You can see Graves and Bay from there. I was a Boy Scout. Uh, you can see there that my lip and the cleft palate look the way they do. I was supposed to have another operation when I was 13, but there was no money. Uh, and so uh, my teeth and my mouth have been the subject of 10 uh, oral surgeons throughout my life. But Fintown was great. We lived in little Norway where all the Norwegians lived. But, uh, and this is on 8th Avenue and 44th Street. I delivered the Finnish newspapers in Fintown. Uh, in the Spanish Quarter, I had my first crush on a, a girl across the street. And then all my best friends and where I grew up in my intellectual life was, is, was in the uh, oops, uh, Jewish community. Uh, so it was a diverse world in which I, I circulated. My parents had sent home, uh, with the steamer trunks, they sent a lot of art books. Well, not so many art books, but there were some. Uh, among them were images, and they weren't in color, but they were black and white, where you can see where my work is coming from. Um, there was another one here. Uh, I'm pressing this button again too, too hard. So it, it, this was my life at that time. I wanted to write the great Finnish American novel. At that point, I was already a copywriter when I, the middle picture. I loved chess, and I made a self-portrait uh, when I was 15 or 16 of that. And then I was studying the Bible. Uh, and so this was my life. Lips, words, scripture. Um, until I got to Wagner College and uh, uh, during that first freshman year, my father passed and, and I decided that I needed to, uh, you know, beat this lip trip that I had. And so I asked out 
uh, the cheerleader of the uh, captain of the cheerleader leader team. She was in my history class and she was the uh, uh, girlfriend of the star quarterback. And I said to her, her name was Ann, and I said, Ann, can you do me a favor? And of course she, you know, said, yeah, what, what? Of course I will. Can you go out with me? And she said, what would we do? We take the Staten Island Ferry, we'll go to New York, we'll see a movie and, 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 and dinner. And she said, well, I have to ask Jay. Jay was the quarterback. A week later or two weeks, yeah, a week later, it was a once a week class. She comes into the class and says, Jay says it's okay. Uh, he has an away game that weekend. So we, we left the dorm, dorms, you know, I called on her and in, in the midst of all kinds of people, you know, that noon time, lunchtime, and people saw me going out on the very first date of my life. So we took the ferry, we went into, into, uh, uh, into, into New York. The, the, the story is such that uh, after that, I uh, dated, dated uh, some, I don't know, I count 18 different dates. I got a bank teller job so I could afford all these trips. And, uh, and I always told my partners the, date, the dates that I would, I would not be uh, asking them out again because uh, I was working on something. And that theory worked fine until I met her. We've been married 50 years. Uh, this is here. So uh, I became a copywriter based on a four by five camera my father left for me and that I was tinkering with in the agency and I needed to know that I knew something about photography. And as soon as they heard the word Lindhoff, they said, fine. <laughs> so I became the writer for the Minolta ads that you may have seen. Uh, maybe you have a Minolta SRT 101. I understand they're coming back. Uh, the easy to use fine camera for Niagara Falls, Grand Canyon, Chinatown, and Sesame Street. So I was doing all kinds of copywriting as a writer, not as a photographer. However, I was working with the cameras and photographing Sandy, my wife, uh, sometimes out, out in the country place where we were. Uh, but she, she really didn't want her face in those kinds of pictures. I was also experimenting with focus and depth of field and hanging out of the ninth floor apartment windows. Uh, and so these are my very first self-portraits. I didn't know that's what they were from 1970 already. And you can see some of the influence of things that I do in these pictures with Sandy. And then comes along uh, a Pyron workshops. I had applied, I believe my copy so much that I decided I really needed to go to school. And that's when I applied to RISD. I got rejected for sending pictures that everybody else took. Uh, so I didn't know anything about photography and I saw the ad in the New York Times that there was a workshop and I had to choose between these teachers. If you read the list, I'll save some time here. I went to MoMA, looked at the portfolios. And when I saw the work of Dion Arbus, I knew who I wanted to study with. Uh, today, knowing, having known Robert Frank, I, I missed a, a big thing there, and sure, certainly the others too. Uh, the the uh, long story of that is that, of course, it was the year in which Arbus decided to leave this world, so I never met her, but I felt like I made my first picture actually for her, knowing her work from MoMA. Benson, I loved his work. He was a great teacher. Uh, it was my first workshop. I don't think I slept at all. Uh, Maggie May, Rod Stewart, and Rolling Stone, all that stuff kept us uh, you know, awake and the pictures that we were trying to make. But here it's great that the man is nude and the, the woman is dressed. There's John with a, a weed, great guy. He's still in California, he's about 89 or something like that. But what he told me after I showed him my work the first two days, he said, this isn't what this place is about. And he tried to almost say, well, you know, you can maybe get your money back. And I said, no, I need better advice. So that's what he told me. Take a day off. Five-day workshop, Monday and Tuesday gone, Wednesday off. 
I had two days left. So I make my first self-portrait, official kind of self-portrait, giving the camera the responsibility for making the image. I said, you take the picture. I'll set it up. I'll point it at this mirror, not at me. And let's see what we get. So it starts with that. And it goes and flies off for a year. Here I wanted to, I got bullied on the bus and I wanted to turn it into a kind of a cathedral. Um, uh, and these I sent to Callahan. And, and it, he, he was such a great teacher. He, he, un, he wanted people who knew what they wanted to do, had some evidence of it, not, not to come to the program, trying to perfect it to how he saw it, but what was inside us, what our life was about. So even in the advertising agency on life, lunch hours in some offices, I'd you know, make, make these self-portraits. And, and now you're starting to see what's gonna happen in this lecture. We're gonna be showing a lot of pictures side by side. I painted this uh, garbage can black so that uh, uh, you know, I could go into the water with it. It was from the agency. And I never thought, somebody asked me a few years ago, what would have happened if you actually slipped into the, into the muddy bottom? Or I guess it was a muddy bottom with all those lily, lily pads. I didn't think about that. This photograph was published in the Village Voice uh, in a review by A.D. Coleman. And uh, it was for a show called Bedrooms. I'm, I was on my way to work. My office building's on the left. The Venetian blinds are out of the office. And uh, I saw it in the Village Voice in a, in a group show of 200 photographers or something like that. And uh, I, I headed straight for the first bar and I ordered a double Jack Daniels. I do that whenever I celebrate something major, and that was major for me. So here's how they go together. This I can't read because we are gonna run out of time, but this is from A.D. Coleman, if you wanna read it. It's in July 27, 1972 review. This is his review of my first show uh, at the Soho Photo Gallery, and I couldn't believe that either. What I looked like then, Benson Hall, Risley, Harry, Portrait by Stephen Brigidy, beautiful. And this one, oh, I love it, by Emmett Gowan with the radiator, the warmth of Harry. People say he was cold, he was shy. He was none of those. Callahan, Siskin, Eleanor was here also. That's Harry on the left, uh, speaking with the graduate students and the little guy in the back is Aaron. Harry became my father to me in a spiritual way after I lost my father. And, and the, new, the new God was photography. So this is what I look at when I start a picture, I put the camera on a tripod and what do I see? Nothing. I have no assistance, I work alone. And that's what I see. That enters my camera. The camera takes the picture. Who's the photographer? This picture is one of my seminal images, and I'll talk about it later. First, self-portrait in Finland. This one, the slide's not so sharp. When we speak about going the distance and we speak about the workshop, a thing called the power of three, we're gonna be talking about continuity. And the beauty of continuity, like pathways that I mentioned in the quote, is that you can dip into that work all your life. You know, right here, these are all uh, uh, 1972, 73, 73. But later you'll see, I can pick pictures from everywhere. And, and that's what my workshop is about, is that, that like Harry, let you find your way, but nurture it and, and run it through a thing I call the power of three. So these are the pictures that, you can see what my, my mission statement is. I've got to work alone, right? I've got to be nude because if I had clothes on, it would be some advertisement. I left advertising. I can't ask somebody else to take this picture because if I slipped, that would have been the end of my life just as that waste paper basket would have been the end of my life. So I have to work alone. I have to work in the nude. I can't work with assistants because no one could look through the camera and make it. 
There's no photographer in my work. There's just a subject. To prove this picture, I have to show the negative of one day, I'm gonna bring it somewhere so 10 people can say they saw it. We did at the Ed Edwin Health Gallery, we had a show recently, but make the negative the big picture because there you can see the dark line under the, my butt. And what it is is a reflection of the snow, of course. But you would never think to do that today. This is 1974, no word of Photoshop. Same thing with this, 1974, 75, 77. This is at Edwin Howe, they put it up like that. I love this picture that they sent me. Image locations. These are where all the places where I've worked in America. These are the places where I've worked in Mexico and the Bahamas a little bit, Brazil, Colombia, and, and Peru. In Japan, in China, into China, and mostly in Europe. Uh, and the list is there. And in, in a way, what I'm trying to say, I'm trying to position this body because the problem is I only have me generally, although we'll look at others in a moment, but I work with myself, so I've got to change something. What do I change? I change the background. Singles, diptychs, triptychs, and sequences, self-portraits in nature. So now, so that we can run the clock real fast through many of these things, I'm going to let you watch these things. I, I, I may put some, I'm going to do it. I'm going to put some music on. This is by Finnish composer Eino Juhani Rautavara. And, and, and I'm just going to let it go and, and All the years are different, the places are different. These come from all parts of my work. You can see here the, the canoe again with these, this image of my hands and the snow that we had just three days ago or four days ago in, in New England suddenly come together, you know, 46 years apart. I call these our self portraits. I'm with this is with Kertu on the right, I'm on the left. That was with um, um, Coralie. This is with Veronica. Birie. Maya Karina. Gwendolyn. Maya Karina again. So this is kind of like a know what you call it. This is Isabel, the Bahamas. This is with Veronica again. She was in the river. This is 10 years later in Montparnasse.
Tuscany. This is the quote, uh, if you want to uh, understand the painting, you need a chair. It's from Paul Clay, uh, that quote. Uh, the uh, out of limited means new forms emerge. That's George Bar Brock, all the rest are mine. This is also with Isabel in, um, in Paris. So they come together like this. This is in the Lee River in Gulen in China with uh, Ren, who likes to be called Charlotte. Whoops. There it is. This is Almir in, in, in uh, Rio. Should go up in the back and Luciana on Ipanema Beach with the two brothers in the back. So it's a kind of work that, you know, we have, we have great issues about touch and permission is so necessary, but we shouldn't forget touch. This uh, one on the right is a photograph in the uh, uh, Santana in Camprana where the English patient was filmed. This is in Malta, back in Santana. This is in Finland. And you can see how the photographs, I can move my photographs around all the time because they, they talk to each other. They're coming from the same hopefully the same vision, if, if I am bold enough to say that, but, but that's how I feel about them. Uh, and, and in fact, that headline was here coming up where they're there, the birth of a vision. I'm talking about now my own and how I, how I perceive it. Um, 1973, while I was a graduate student, it was on auction in London at one time, and I'm sure, you know, I've mentioned this before in lectures, but it's to me, it's really a good reason to say why I like to teach, why I, I, I am a teacher. Uh, I was a student of Harry's when I made this, but I'm sure the auctioneer didn't say, now we have a student work. I wouldn't do it. Uh, this is a, now a sharper image of that uh, seminal photograph in where I realized that I had to find that position. I had to move to find the position that normally the photographer moves. But because I had no photographer, I had to be kind of the photographer and the subject in one. I had to figure that part out. I was already doing it, but this picture like nailed it for me. Um, so these, you know, you'll see a couple of repeats for this kind of comparison, but these are the seminal images in those first 10 years that generally people, you know, write about people of my age, you know, when, when we kick the bucket, you know, that they'll show that seminal image and they'll, they'll talk about the first works you do with a reverence. And the rest, of, the rest of your work is kind of a struggle. So this is also part of that, 1975, 1970, no, there's 1983. I put them together. I'm doing this for a purpose. It's fists. It's a back, a back and fists like that. And when I had an exhibition in, in Paris around this time, a number of French critics wrote and said that I was following in the footsteps of John Copeland's. And it took Patrick Roger and Le Monde to set the story straight. In French, he said, Bien en vente Copeland's Ilya Minkinen. Um, and this happens. And we're going to talk about this in the workshop. What happens when they have that crossroads? When somebody picks up your work or you pick up their work and you crisscross, you know, and you go like, like that. It, it, for me, it was, it was, it was traumatic especially when people come up to shows sometimes and don't know it. 
So this is what they need to know. And, and I play with, around with this, I, having fun with it, I suppose. Uh, I'd, I'd love to title these, you know, 1980, uh, 1975 uh, BC, uh, 1983 BC, before Copeland's. So these are things. They all belong in that, in that category. This is in Prague. And now I show that this way. So that's the vision. That's what I learned. That's what I did. When I showed the work to uh, Evelyn Deitz at Whitkin Gallery, she said, now I know where the ideas came from. Uh, so workshop time, power of three. And, and it may be, I'm, I'm looking at my Swiss clock. I've got 20 minutes. I'm gonna to try to do this in four minutes. Here's, here's a photographer who took, took this picture, Never mind who. That photographer also, she took this picture. Uh, it's a great picture of a, a hungry cat, a smart cat. I put them together and I say, hmm, there's something similar here. A totally different subject matter. It's not a project, it's a vision. It's, you're, you're, you're deleting something from the image that we don't see or that is hidden, that if we just go past it real fast, we might miss it. You know, you're, you're, you're layering in some things, right? And, and with those three, right? We could say this, we all can make one great picture of a cat in the house. And we put them on Facebook to thousands of likes, but try to get another one that matches it, but is different. Keep it the same, make it different. That takes some doing. And if you've done that, can you do it again? And if you can, and you get your fourth picture, uh, here's my fourth picture. This is a Frank Golke, beautiful image. Whatever that tall grain elevator shadow is on this, on this broken down bank, maybe. We, we, we begin a pathway. That's what this workshop is about. Not being identified by your project, not going to a review and someone saying to you, so let me see your project, just your best project. We only got 15 minutes. When, when you could say, would you like to see my photographs? So in Arl in 2012, I had a student, uh, or let's put it this way, it was actually not my workshop, but it was a workshop that I heard about. And the teacher gave an assignment to bring in the picture you really, really like a lot. And there was a 10 year old boy in the workshop who ran in with this picture for the first assignment. Everybody loved it. The teacher said, okay, now bring me another picture, but make it different. He scratched his head a little bit and said, yeah, I think I can do that, right? Make it different, keep it the same. So he brings in his flying ant, Benashi flying off this balustrade. Everybody loves the picture, right? He, he did it, made it different, keep it the same. Well, so we have these two in comparison, right? And, 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 but the boy wants to know why, well, I see that they're you know, different, but why are they the same? And the teacher said, well, it's easy. Look, in the first picture, you were photographing this race car, but you're not a sports photographer. You are interested in the bystanders equally. It's almost divided in half that way. And I know what happened. She said, yeah, I don't know. The camera went up, the sliding back went up and you were panning at the same time. So you elongated the wheel, fantastic. And in the other one, you're dealing with science again, flight, gravity, but it's a person and she's looking at you. You're interested in humanity. So he said, I'm a photographer. Teacher said, no, 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 one more. And he brings his masterpiece on the Boulevard de Bologna. This woman is walking against time, you know, turn of the century. The car is entering, the horse is leaving. The horse's leg is forlorn. He's looking longingly back at the stole of the mink. The dog's spindled legs are mimicked in the, in the, in the wheels of the car and the hat spins this picture around. 
Congratulations, now you're a photographer. Lartique, of course. So how do we stay on this bus that we find the pathway? This I'm gonna to try to do in two minutes. There's a bus station in Helsinki where all the buses leave from different platforms, but five or six all from the same platform. And they take the same route out of the city for a good 10 minutes. And it's kind of a, a metaphor or analogy to the kind of thing where you would hop on someone else's bus. You're riding it and you find out, oh God, this is Harry Callahan's bus or this is Gary Winogrand's bus. So you hop off. You come back to the bus after two years and lots of portfolio reviews where they say you're making Winogrand pictures. So you come back to the, or if you're a poet, you're writing like Billy Collins, right? Or your music is like John Cage. So you come back to the Helsinki bus station. You head out again on another bus. Now you're shooting, you know, in the South, uh, the Civil War landscapes and Sally's done that. Always somebody who's done that. Always a book in the back of the, you know, the library that you can pull out and say, look at this, do something original. Well, what the Helsinki bus station says is if you look at the map, uh, I think this is the, yeah, there. If you look at the map, all the buses go anywhere, all different places. They're only together for 10 minutes. They ride for an hour and a half. And so during that, Long, long thing. That's where you, that's where Ralph Gibson is suddenly not doing the kind of work that I was so admiring of and felt I was following in his footsteps or riding his bus. He went off to color up close to walls. You know, it, 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 it's that, it's that ability to, to just be patient with your pathway. It doesn't work as well with projects unless you're talking in decades. Anyway, you can go online probably and a plug in Helsinki bus station and maybe with my name and you'll, you'll learn more about it. So I'm going to go back to the wild and, and, and say that it's in, probably impossible for me to do this whole, but I've gotten to the workshop. That was important. I got to the Helsinki bus station, very important. I've got into some of the beginning. Let's just look at pictures. Um, this is, uh, I'm on top of a ski jump. I've got my uh, wrists wrapped around a pipe, uh, around the uh, wooden beams. Uh, there's, a, there's a drawing of where I'm at, the arrow points to it. This is the 60 meter ski jump, right? I had, like the, like the black barrel uh, over my head, I didn't know how to get out of it, frankly. I had to find two trees to slam the thing in and yank myself out. Here, it was a struggle. It was a blizzard, it was cold. I just said, I know I can do this. And the night before I was in my bed, I said, I know I'm gonna do it. Uh, at least it wasn't the 90, not that I would have survived any better. When I came out of this picture, I stepped out, I'm freezing. The snow is all bloody like those hospital uniforms and, and uh, my adhesive tape, because there was ice under this whole thing. It was all sharp ice. I put it together with this early picture. Again, for the power of three, and I gotta get back to that. So if I combine these things, you know, it's fun. This is in the Burn River. And here I'm like a rubber band. Here I'm doing a surface dive, life-saving surface dive. So it's about motion, water, even together, I like them better maybe. Uh, very recent in Arizona, North Carolina, Maine. Dead man swimming this summer. Strand in Norway. Together. Here I'm showing some of the places where I show my work, thinking this could re relieve some of the monotonous aspect of the same subject matter. But uh, so I'll take that picture on the wall there. You will see it in the next grouping. Well, first, this is in Berlin opening at the Blumquist Art Gallery uh, auction house where Munch 
And I had the chance to be on the walls of Edvard Munch and I was just really flabbergasted by that. That There's that same picture, this one. 1989, 1992, uh, 2007 in Norway, Lofoten Islands, a big climb, put them together. Now I'm going to play tic-tac-toe. So you're going to watch three pictures, the series, three pictures, the series, three pictures, the series, and then we see the whole thing. Goes like that. Finland, also Finland, a rapid uh, hydroelectric plant. Glen Lake, New York, together. Asikawa, Finland, 92. Uh, during uh, uh, Risley days in, in uh, Little Compton, Rhode Island. Uh, during Risley days in Patchogue, where we, the, the ice thing was also, where that black uh, garbage can, not the same spot. I was worried that I'd, I'd, I'd break the ice with all those flames. But I wasn't thinking about the gasoline that might be spilling over. So here's, here's, the, here's another option for if the, the penis uh, and, and, and the wave became too difficult to, to exhibit, I always have this backup called waiting for the snake made in, in, in China where I had to have a doctor next to me in the morning because they said there are lethal snakes in there. I didn't see any. So there's the tic-tac-toe. Uh, let's see how far I can go. I, I've, I've got like seven minutes on my watch here, although maybe I have more because the, the beginning was, yeah, I do have. Great. You can let me know though. So we're going out west to, uh, every once in a while. Canyon de Chez, Switzerland. Again, Canyon de Chez. Uh, yeah, that was, that was, they were put together that way. I've got a big exhibition coming in, in, in Europe. I can't tell you where, but, but uh, some of these, these images, uh, they want them like mural size and, and larger, uh, which is a tendency. Uh, this is the Three Sisters in uh, Monument Valley, Muley Point. Uh, here I'm standing in the shadow of Carlton Watkins, whose work I just adore. Uh, it's the same place. It's a 32 cent stamp uh, um, on the other side. So I came to this side of it. Uh, and these now come together here. Uh, or like that and that. And then this is in Lima, a big uh, uh, solo retrospective uh, uh, just a few years ago, where that picture will pop up as well as the one in the back, which is in Maroon Bells. This kind of shows you how some of the pictures are hung. And in our workshop, we're gonna be, we're gonna be looking towards the wall more than we're gonna be looking towards the book. Because you, to get the book, you need the wall. Unless you pay for the book. This one I made just recently in Arizona. It, it, it's, when I showed it to, to someone at the National Park in uh, Picacho Peak, I think it's called, yeah. Uh, uh, he gave it a title, The Hand of God. Uh, I, I posted it on Facebook with, with, with a caption that said something to the effect that, you know, the, the planet doesn't belong to West Virginia. And uh, here in the Grand Canyon from 1995. I love how the strands of my uh, hair run along the, the south rim. I'm on the north rim. My feet are under a heavy boulder, not a boulder, but a, a log uh, that I can can a leader off and my hands are gripping the edge of the, of the, of the, of the, of the cliff. The camera is on another cliff that I had to hop to, a long cable release, as you saw in the opener of the, of the show. I'm now back in Arl. You see some of the images here, but I'm there because this show, this was first shown there. And this was my first foray into digital. I was teaching at Anderson Ranch, great workshop there. And I, I allowed the students to come see me work, but they have to come early in the morning because I don't teach on 
I don't work on teaching time. Uh, so I had scouted this out before the workshop began and, and watched how the sun, as it rises, drops down the maroon bells, it gives it their name. And there was a window of like 10 minutes, not even, when it, it's at the position where it's now. And I told them, you know, if you want to see me work, you got to get up early. And we left around five. Uh, and I told them to go photographing themselves. Don't take pictures of me photographing or you'll, I don't want you getting a better one. Um, and I went out there not having tested anything. And there they see their professor. Uh, I'm not totally new, I'm in my boxers. It's glacial water, it's freezing. And this is impossibly difficult to, to do with your arms. After two or three tries, I was, I was ready to give up and, and they could see that I'm stumbling and shivering like crazy, those who might've been looking. And then I say, okay, well, I'm a Finn. I go out one more time and the gods were with me. Uh, it was the last moment I could probably get, get it. I came down to the shore, I looked at it, I couldn't believe it in the screen. I never had a chance to really look at it on the way, other than when I worked with Polaroid for a while. And I started to cry. Uh, and that was, that was because, because I, had, I had witnesses, I had, the, I had my negative. They saw it. I, and they, and, and, that I can be trusted. I don't, you know, and I, I was told that the, the thing to do is just keep that original memory card, don't buy memory cards. I mean, buy memory cards, don't keep them. Uh, no, keep them. Well, I got that wrong. So here's another one of these wonderful little anecdotes, but I, I'm not gonna have time for it. If you see it again, look for the fly. It landed on my back while I was underwater for about 45, 50 seconds which was necessary to get the water back to being the mirror that it was. And so my, my mission was to become a rock and I fooled a fly. I also did it at night then when I knew that it worked. Well, I didn't know if it worked because I, until I processed this, these are film, but I knew that I could do it. So these are on the other side like that. That you saw, this is another one. And this is another one that you haven't seen. It's a little bit light here, uh, but pulled together. I'll shut up for a little while. I got maybe seven minutes. Dead horse point. It's a picture called Height. Uh, it was like the ski jump. I knew the day before that I would do it. Um, when you're doing pictures like this one, and I, I come to the conclusion that even then, you, you, there can be nobody around. This is a place where there is a parking lot and um, you can't have anybody there because if you fall, you do die. And you don't want to, you know, I'm, if you're going to do that, if that's going to happen, then that has to happen solo. Um, Cannon Beach and a nice rock. And the, the rocks like each other. Sundance, Joshua Tree, Inspiration Point. Los, uh, New Orleans, Kyoto, Japan, next to David Bowie's house. He had passed by then, but it was right on that same road. I don't know what that matters, but it does. Uh, uh, another one of the museums where the work is shown, this one was a big retrospective a few years ago also. Uh, this is made in, in, it's called Gravity Sleeps in, in, on the Adriatic. And this is up on uh, yeah, Continental D Divide, Independence Pass. And I love them together.
these are very finished. That's Axeli Gala Gala La Sal that I had a chance to photograph there. I showed one of his paintings of his mother and the Swan of Dorn or Lemminkainen earlier on. Uh, but, but this is very finished. White sands, and we saw that before. So, so it, it's it's when you have the power of three, when you have you have this long line, this big suitcase. It, it's it's a lot of fun at this time in, in in one's life. If you've been at it, I've been at it fifty years. I haven't missed a year. In some year, but nineteen seventy seven, I just have that one picture of three fingers. Speaking of this. This is just thrown here. It's 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 my footsteps in making this picture uh, in white sands. How I left that spot without, I don't know, but to me that's crazy. This is in in uh, Lianzhou in China, and and so this picture speaking to this, the mountains are speaking, and when we think about the world and all this hatred and everything that's going on. And we think about the planet, you know, I know animals kill each other need to do that, but I don't know. It's one world. I had the globe on before I turned it off because I didn't want to be preaching, but maybe that's what I am trying to do. This is uh, uh, near that same spot on, on uh, Grand Canyon. And this is for, for uh, uh, Dean Potter, who perished uh, from inspiration from uh, uh, Glacier, no, what's uh, uh, the top one in uh, Yosemite. Uh, I had a chance to photograph uh, for the New York Times, America's best female rock climbers for Play Magazine, Sunday Times. And uh, got to meet Dean Potter and Steph Davis and, and Beth Rodden, and a whole bunch of uh, wonderful people. And, and uh, so uh, uh, Dean and, 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 and uh, Steph, were, they were a couple, they were an item. And uh, I wanted to give them a print uh, and I'd send them a print. And so Steph said, here to Dean, pick, pick one out from a book called Saga. Uh, and and uh, so this is the picture he wanted. And I, under, I understood it. His life depended on his fingers as a, as a mountain climber. He, he, he was soloing on, a, on, a, on a, a glider and it didn't open. So, uh, so sometimes they wind up in Paris Metro, in, in Milan, in Tokyo. Boats, you can tell that, that the boat is, is a, a, a great uh, vehicle. It floats. It weighs nothing on water. It's a ton on land. Uh, Dals Niebuhr in Norway. Tower Arch, about the same size guy. Delicate Arch, Mesa Arch. The one on the left was, was actually made just very recently. Uh, but I will go back to it. Uh, Rancho de Taos. Out in the Adriatic. Uh, Foster's Pond. This was a lecture at the uh, Tribune uh, of the David. Old man, place called Hope. Near uh, uh, Ghost Ranch. Abacu. Those of you who know it, uh, O'Keefe's place is just down the road. Or was. Zagreb. That's not a river, it's my hand. <laughs> a little bit of Bernice Abbott in that one, I think. This is in Cleveland. I photographed from hotels, as you can see. 
nude ascending a staircase, nude descending a staircase. Temple of Zeus in Athens. This is in Toulouse church. In Veve, where these pictures were for a, a big uh, festival in 2014. This was next to our hotel, actually. And they had this one up in there. The, they had a Cindy Sherman here two years earlier. So they, they had good success with that. I don't think they would have been able to. There's a bank that allowed this to happen. And this story is, is one that has, you know, uh, the, the way to tell it is, it's, it's the former Shelton Towers where George O'Keefe and Alfred Stieglitz held court. They were on the 30th floor. I rented the room of the Marriott, which it became on the 29th floor. And, uh, and when I, I wanted to take the pictures of the buildings that Stieglitz had been photographing and O'Keefe had been painting the landscapes. And so this particular landscape is what I wanted to see that space, but this got in the way. So I pulled them aside, as you can see. And that was 49th Street where we lived, where the Venetian blinds were and my advertising agency was. So, and this is near, near to, you, to your coast, Oxford. Uh, Arnold, <clears throat> this is Peter. Um, we're getting some questions in and I'd like yeah. to talk to you a little bit. Let's, so, let's stop it here. Okay, if that's good for you, I was just gonna say. Yeah, it is because I, there's no way that I can get to some of the other things and, and not to, uh, I'm not, uh, maybe I should say that after this, the pictures aren't so good. <laughs> that's, that's a little bit self-congratulatory. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think I speak for everyone. It was amazing work and amazing storytelling. Uh, I particularly just kind of loved how you introduced everything uh, with your family photos and the stories. I, I just, I love how that kind of segued into your work. Now, I have a couple of questions, but I just wanted to say one thing first. When I was reading about you, it didn't mention Cindy Sherman, simply by guess the comparisons to self-portraiture. And then you talked about uh, the, the Deanne Arbus class you were gonna take, you never met her, but you, you did that first picture, which was very reminiscent of her. And when I teach one of my classes, I show Arbus's work next to uh, Sherman's work. And I ask my students, I say, which do you think is more re revealing? Which do you think is more personal? And, and there's no right or wrong answer. Most people tend to say Cindy Sherman. And I always say, I think Deanne Arbus's work is so much more revealing. I look at her work and I, and I really see, you know, or think I see, you know, who she is. I knew her very little bit when I was a kid, but I didn't really know her. Cindy Sherman is more characters. And, and your work is so revealing through self-portraiture. I just, I was really kind of amazed and taken with, with your journey, as I kind of use that word to introduce you, but it, it really was a journey. So I had a couple of questions. There's a part of me as a photographer that wants to ask you like, well, how did you take these amazing pictures? Technically, I don't want to in a way, you can talk about it if you want. I, I kind of enjoy the mystery and just kind of, you know, the experience of looking at the pictures and not wondering or worrying about how they was taken. But, you know, you mentioned you go to places you needed different backdrops. And so your process, how much pre-visualization do you do to create the photo, to make the photo? You mentioned visiting and, and, and then kind of uh, for that one lake shot with the students, so does the, the background when you go there, does that kind of influence you and then start that creative process? Or do you go there with um, some kind of pre-visualization that you want to accomplish? I would say it's 95% uh, spontaneous. It happens there. Um, and even in that one, I didn't quite know if I could do that and I had to find the rock. So that one probably would be in the category of having uh, mapped it out. Probably also, I figured this way that with the students, it, I had nothing to lose. If I failed, it would be a good lesson. If I succeeded, it would be a good lesson. Um, on, on the uh, question of, of, of how, how they're taken, 
the there's the image of, of my feet walking on water from 1974. And we did a, a film uh, I'm kind of in, going in, in towards film actually, but we did a film, uh, it was a sort of a, a 50 minute um, a, a documentary on, 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 on my work by a Finnish filmmaker, cinematographer. And uh, he wanted me to, 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 he asked if could we reenact the picture with me walking on water? And I wasn't so crazy about that. But I said, okay, well, let's see what it would look like. And if it, if it retains the magic, then, then, well, maybe we can always ditch it. And so we, we presented it to, to a, an audience in, in uh, Cannes. Uh, it was a preview, small audience. And my French gallerist's daughter was in the, uh, with her mother there. And afterwards she, or my, my, she told me that her, uh, Natalie had said to her, excuse me, said to her that uh, when, I, you know, and this is, she was now nine, but she said, when I was a really little girl, I used to always think he was standing on a crocodile. And when I heard that, I said, okay, you know, a quote I could have put, it, put up, you know, it, it comes from uh, Brian Cousy that uh, unless we see with the eyes of a child, we make no art, uh, that, that, um, I didn't want, so I said, we have to, I don't want to kill the crocodile. And even though I know that it would be very important for people to understand how I do something, and maybe why I cried was it was because they could see it, hmm. you know? And, and so uh, with 42 years of negatives to prove every picture is what it is. Um, the, uh, the, that, that opening up for the digital it really did help because it it, it, it it sent the curve back up in terms of production. Let me let me ask you a question, and this may seem like a strange question, or maybe it won't be, but how did this kind of process over the years affect your relationship with your own body? Um, I mean, I, how do you think it was different for you than it might be for anyone else, especially as you get older? I'm getting older and I'm very aware of the relationship with my body, but you were kind of hyper aware. And I have to believe that you practiced yoga or something because it looks like it was some extraordinary physical feats. But is there anything to talk about in, in that kind of relationship and how it evolved? I, I think what it, it came down to is I was strong enough to lift my own weight. <laughs> And, and that's, that's essential. And, and then the other thing was that, that uh, you have to think like a photographer or you have to think like me maybe, but you have, to, you, have to, you have to see the opportunity that the space gives you to do it safely, maybe. Uh, but most of the pictures are fraught with danger. There is, there, you know, I, I've been thinking about that a lot lately that uh, because I am, you know, 76 now, and, and uh, some of these pictures probably uh, I wouldn't dare maybe do. I'm afraid that I would do them, and because whenever I get the, if the idea comes to me, I'll, I'll I'm looking at a, uh, you know, at the ice out here on the pond, and there's a, there's a birch log that's coming down, and it's beautiful, and there could be some water that I could work with, and the reflection of that, and but, but uh, would I be able to get out of that space? And then what would happen on the ice if I'm nude? No. Uh, this is the ice, you know? Uh, um, so it's a really good question. And, and I, it's, it's, it's on the top of my mind. <laughs> Someone once told me, you know, to make great photographs, you have to kind of go the extra mile and, and your workshop's called Going the Distance. I notice that I haven't been going quite as far these days simply because of physical limitations. And so, so it, it's understandable. Um, we wanna to get to some questions in the chat, but um, we do these five questions and these are quick answers and they're just kind of like fun questions. And so uh, I'm just gonna go through them. What's your favorite book or movie? Um, uh, I would I would put Ulysses, uh -huh. the top on the book, and eight and a half. So the, that's great. Well, what's your favorite drink? Uh, uh, Eagle Rare, a bourbon. A bourbon? 
Yeah, it, it's called Eagle Rare. Okay. Very uh, good. What part of the world would you love to visit that you haven't seen yet? India. India, interesting. That'd be an interesting place for the kind of work you do, for sure. Yeah. Um, what profession other than photography would you have enjoyed? Being a film director, which I'm going to try to do. Okay. And then lastly, tell us something about you that we wouldn't possibly know. <laughs> I love women's underwear. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Um, so Arno, I have some questions here. I think the first one was from Chihalas. Sure. And uh, in the photographs with women, with your head, quote, missing, does it feel like decapitation, hiding? Is the head cropped as a photography move? Does this urge make the two bodies one as a way of unifying you both, since this gesture is manifested more than once, more than twice? I'm so interested to hear your thoughts. I love your work, as you know. Thank you, Shahalis. Um, the, uh, you know, <clears throat> as, excuse me. Just a word about the questioner uh, that, that she's, she's uh, also a very fine photographer and, and one with great thought and her, I'm not surprised by the, by the, the uh, originality of the question as yours, Peter, it was really great. Um, I, 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 yeah, I have to say that um, the reason I showed all that stuff in the beginning, you know, and it's, it's really true that that moment when the ether ball came down, I, I, that was exactly how I was feeling. That was the second operation and I'm guessing I was eight months or six months, probably six months old. And then <clears throat> to have, this kind of a deformity on your face when when your 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 mother reinforces it to you. You know, then then you start to believe it. And you know, um, you know, if I'm on a bus or even you know, maybe now I'm an old man, I have a a, a bushier beard, but, but when I was younger, you know. Kids stare at you, and that's you know that's okay, but but you, you sort of you know there there there's a picture I, I failed to put in here I forgot, but it, it it's called um, uh, a head without a face, really power re, re, very recent picture shells you know that I think, uh, or I can send it to you but but it 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 sums up why I do it. Yeah. Um. Amy asks, I find doing self-portraiture very gratifying, uh, but much different than doing straight portraiture. How many images did you average to get the one you wanted? It must have been so difficult and setting up these treacherous locations. And as an aside, I love your pairings and how your images speak to each other. Uh, what was the question in that? The comment is very nice. Yeah, I guess there really isn't. Uh, how many images did you uh, average oh, see, to get yeah. the one you wanted? There it is. Well, when, when it was filmed, you know, I would take, and that, that's a really good question. I, when it was filmed, like the one with one leg and, and my rear end, I could not believe that when I processed it, where did I go? Where was I? <laughs> right? And, and, and I took two, no, I took one of that because it was so slippery, so cold. And I had no way of knowing, did it work or didn't it work? It was kind of like, you know, and, and the, the one on the boardwalk uh, with my mouth open, I took one two weeks later or a week later. And actually I, I had to process, <clears throat> I had to process it sooner for class. But, but um, so a lot, of, a lot of the really big pictures uh, over the years, the three fingers, I could, I could list a bunch of them. My back in the water, that's a seminal picture for me. One negative, one negative. Later, as I started going out west, I would, I would bring more film and, and I would, but I'd always do a variant. I, I rarely tried the same thing. Uh, 
Uh, but with digital, what's now happened uh, is that you can you can review. And, and with Polaroid, it was expensive, and you had to wait and do all kinds of things with it. And then the light changed, so it wasn't very practical. But with the digital, and with that <coughs> picture in, in my room, Bells in Aspen, um, I, I, I couldn't have done another one. It, it was it was so painful, actually. Uh, and so, so, but when it's not, when it's simple enough, but when it's even simple, you know, to get, I mean, if you want to get your hands around a birch tree, it might say, oh yeah, that's fine. But where you have to be to do that, <laughs> right? And so maybe the birch tree breaks or something else happens so that, I don't shoot a lot, and and uh, but when I'm on to something, uh, I, I I I think I have a good batting average, if if the works are working. I think so. That that shot of you between the two birch trees, by the way, uh, both times I kind of seen it today and the other day, it just makes me laugh. I don't know why. It just I think it's just beautiful and amusing and funny yeah. picture. Well, the, um, the, the humor is, is welcomed. <laughs> uh, I think it was because it was like, where's Arno? <laughs> and it's, there's that sliver yeah. of you between the two trees. Um, Levon asks, and I'm not really sure what this pertains to, I can guess. Can you tell us a little how you use your timer? Maybe that's the self timer, or maybe he, he understands something I don't. Well, the very first ones were with the Linhoff four by five by, uh, you know, uh, the, the picture with my, uh, I mean, this way on the balcony, for instance, that's a four by five, and it happens to be a Polaroid, actually. Uh, it, it's, it's a little buzzer thing that goes bzzz. So you got maybe eight seconds, nine seconds. It doesn't always go off. So you have to re-screw it. Then I got the cable release with the bulb. I had that, that for like 20, 30 years. Hmm. And, and, and I got a longer one, but then the power wasn't enough sometimes to fire it. And there you are hanging off of something, right? And, and it doesn't fire, you know it doesn't fire because it, it doesn't advance, right? Uh, and it was only with the, with the digital that you could get an intervalometer. And, and the intervalometer has really opened up a, a, a lot of possibilities. For one thing, you could take it further away. Uh, you could be further away, mm -hmm. uh, but to, to give an in, 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 uh, cable release story that might be interesting, there was a picture of me standing out on on the uh, the precipice uh, at, at Dalsniba in Geiranger Fjord, Norway. It happens to be the summer home of the Queen of Norway, and we were there as invited guests from a festival, and and the cultural minister, after I took all the requisite you know tourist shots with my phone, turned to me and said. Um, aren't you going to make a picture? And I said, do you know what I do? And he says, be our guest. So evidently he did. And uh, I realized that I would not be able to make that picture without an assistant. And I don't use assistants. So I have to figure out how do I do it? Well, Alex Webb and Rebecca Norris happened to be with us, with Sandy and I. They were also in the festival. We were taking a little tour. And... <clears throat> I said to Alex, can you, can I deputize you to be my self timer? And, and what we're going to do, and he said, yeah, sure. Uh, we're going to tape up the back of my Pentax. So definitely you don't see it. You're going to turn around and people are going to notice that you're turned around. And when I give the signal, then you count to nine seconds, right? So I, I could get out a little bit further. Nowadays I could do it. So it, Technically, you could do that picture now easy. Because I, what I didn't want to do is press it myself and run. There would have been no way to stop. Uh, you, you can't believe what it felt like it, it, to be uh, on that with bare toes. There are some hikers that take pictures of themselves with boots and sticks. But to go out there and just feel the wind on your naked body and your toes holding on. And so he fired, I, and, and it, you know, I found that out later, it's on film. But as I returned back to put my clothes on, there was a huge round of applause 
And I looked up and it was from the next level where a tourist bus of, of Japanese tourists were all applauding my nudity on the point of that Dalsneva. That's funny. That's very funny. Uh, I'm sure that's probably the first and last time you got applause for, for <laughs> one, of, one of your photos, at least in the process. Yeah. Um, I think we're kind of running out of time and I think we've run through all the questions. Uh, I can't tell you how enjoyable it was. I, I love looking at your work and the way you did it by kind of repeating and, and putting them together was so effective. I would urge everyone to go to your website and what you'll see there is this is chronology to the years, pictures taken by year. And, and when I referred to the journey, it was that chronological journey and kind of watching your process over the years, you know, from then to, to current. Uh, do that and do your, you know, give yourself a treat and, 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 and look at that and, and uh, you get to see these pictures again. There's nothing like repetition of images to kind of emotionally connect to them. I really believe that. Be they personal photos or, or, or art or whatever, it's repetition, you know, from advertising is the key to, to kind of, you know, processing and, and, and fully kind of, you know, uh, ingesting it however you want to kind of put it so thank you once again so we left off with uh an image of a hand that was pointing to dubrovnik in southern croatia and when you first see it you have this feeling well what's that underneath it that looks like a shadow but it's really not and then you want it to be a shadow. And there's something about the way I work that I'm looking for pictures that once you get it, it sort of slips back to asking a question, well, wait a minute. And that it does that all the time. And in our workshop, we're going to be looking for that kind of image making where we see the photograph fresh every time we look at it. It's a tough one. Uh, but it is a very, very remarkable parameter for the continuity of work, especially. Anyhow, here you see that photograph as we showed them before in the company of other pictures uh, from China and, and Finland. And what I'm doing here is just trying to float through some of the uh, imagery also in the context of where they have been shown. This was in uh, uh, Sao Paulo in, in Brazil. This is a thing called frequent flyer. The image uh, on the left is of my feet dangling in the water in Finland. Um, in the center is my torso in uh, uh, Massachusetts, where we live. Uh, I was born in Finland, so the one on the left is Finland, and the, the center one is Massachusetts. And these are these are shot these are shot one after the other on the same roll of film with the same camera. Uh, meaning I traveled from Finland back to the US. And then the third one is again, that camera just dedicated to this hopeful uh, success where uh, my father was born, which is in Japan. So it's called Frequent Flyer. There are others of this uh, nature that I've worked on in around the turn of the century. Um, uh, here, here's one. This is a, a more complex one. Uh, the, the top one, if I get these correct, the uh, top one is uh, uh, in Finland. Uh, the, the next one is in uh, the USA. The next one is in uh, uh, Switzerland. Then we have Alaska, Switzerland, Finland. And down the bottom row, Switzerland, uh, Finland, and USA. Uh, you can see tic-tac-toe, Switzerland kind of wins this one. Here, that same thing you see on the right is with the picture from the Bahamas we looked at. This was a major uh, retrospective in a museum that's just to the right of this. Here, uh, I'm combining two images from different points uh, of, of the career. And again, in our workshop, we're going to be paying attention to how something you photograph on Tuesday can go with something you photographed a Tuesday two years ago or a Thursday coming up. Because once you're on a pathway, you can do that kind of shuffling around pretty easy. 
um, in the one I'm above the Rio Grande and in the other I'm under water in Maine. Sometimes I like to get absurd. And the one on the left is in Finland and it's hard to kind of find me there. And the other one is called the card players, uh, you know, uh, in, in, uh, around this table. And that round table, I guess, you know, you could say, this, this is the uh, Oscar Niemeyer uh, uh, Center of Art in, in Aviles in Spain, where I had a retrospective with this image that was the cover of it, a beautiful show. And the first time that a show was called just by my, by my name, last name. Uh, I didn't know if that would cut it in Spain, but they said it, it does. Uh, and this is called 10, 10, 10. And uh, as I may have mentioned, there was a 777 of my three fingers, uh, an 8888, a 9999, uh, 10, 10, 10. And I have also the 11 and the 12. Uh, pretty soon there's going to be two, two, no, two, 22, 22. Uh, and I'm hoping I succeed in making something on the occasion of those mathematical numbers. Uh, this is currently uh, on exhibit in Paris in a show called Clouds. This is called Cloud Catcher. It's made in uh, Veve uh, in Switzerland. And there is a swan out there that in a big mural print uh, you can say hello to. And it goes with this uh, waterfall from Oregon, uh, the uh, Horsetail Falls on the uh, Columbia River Gorge. Here you see two pictures on the wall, one of them being the one you just saw on the, on the right. Uh, this is a, 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 a group uh, museum visit by this, this enthusiastic crowd of art lovers and photography lovers in, in, in Cannes, in the northern part of, of France. You can see I was a happy camper. So there's that image and, and this one uh, that were on the wall. Um, this is uh, my limbs pretending they're part of a stand of birch trees in Finland. Or sometimes, you know, you find these odd, odd juxtapositions uh, that I don't know how to quite explain this one, but that's what they are. There's a bit of humor, of course. And, uh, you know, we look for all the emotions in the, in the workshop, images that can enlighten us, frighten us, uh, make us uh, sad maybe, but sometimes and most often make us uh, euphoric, very happy, very informed, very concerned, all the emotions. And uh, an exhibition again, this in, is, is in uh, Putin land, in St. Petersburg, in Russia, the Air Arta, the Contemporary Museum of Art, uh, where I had the whole sixth floor. Uh, and this was the lecture uh, that was attended by a huge crowd. And the prints are all over the place there. And when I look at this and I think about the current situation you know, with Ukraine and, 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 and how countries just don't get it, uh, you know, whether it's us or Russia or whatever the countries are, we, we forget that we're all the same. We're just human beings, you know? And, and especially now as COVID is coming around the corner and lives are, are, are not being lost, why would, why would anyone wanna go into a country and start killing people? Doesn't make sense. This is a, uh, uh, the, the, the same exhibition in smaller format, however, in Moscow. Uh, when I was there, I, I did make this picture, uh, uh, not knowing then exactly what Putin was up to, but this is at the Kremlin. And now I look at my arm going that way, and it's kind of like telling me, if you read from left to right, it's telling Putin to retreat, you know, take it easy, let the traffic just keep going and live normal lives there. And as a counteract to it, you know, this is in Weehawken in New Jersey, where where these, these new buildings and the, the, the new skyscrapers that just reach right out of the frame. Maybe my hand is helping lift it up a little bit. Uh, a triptych um, that, that has a kind of quietness. 
And you can see from my backgrounds, you know, that this isn't a self-portrait workshop. This isn't about how to make self-portraits or having to take your clothes off or anything like that. It's about what you want to do, what you want to advance. Do you want to work in nature? Do you want to work in cities? Do you want to work with other people? Here's my wife and I in Switzerland. And, and another one with the two of us from uh, 1975 uh, or six, something like that. No, 1974 actually, in Finland, Switzerland, and then here in Massachusetts. Our son, uh, when he was a little guy, uh, we've, I've, we made photographs, quite a few of them. I'm gonna show you some of that work fairly rapidly here as well. Uh, this is in Philadelphia when I was a uh, visiting artist at the Philadelphia College of Art, which today is the University of the Arts. You're gonna see maybe some of the students from that soon. Now again, uh, his name is Daniel and uh, we're counting fishes that are floating, floating across in this part of the lake. Pictures speak for themselves. And, and this is a document that started in 1979. Uh, these are early, early 1980s pictures. So these come you know, more with the, with the uh, inspiration and we'll talk a lot about inspiration and, and other photographers' works and how they can, how they can nourish our, our thought patterns, challenge us. Uh, but here again, Callahan and Barbara and Emmett Gowan and Edith, and some of the kids that were in that very first classic book of Emmett's. Uh, Dan growing up to be his own man. Uh, and, and this one in, in um, Foster's Pond, which was part of a portfolio that Aperture did. And one of my favorite ones, uh, when we came back from Finland, he, he was uh, just uh, you know, at that cusp of having learned how to speak Finnish and speaking English. So his mind thought in both languages. Uh, I like the feeling in this that you know, I'm giving him his freedom and yet I'm also trying to be a protective guardian angel. Switzerland, 1975 on the right, Oregon, 2005. So this is a book called Saga, which it, 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 it looks like this. And it was published in your state in San Francisco from Chronicle uh, Books and it's uh, essays by Alan Lightman who wrote Einstein's Dreams, a wonderful long running critic and, you know, understander, if that's a word, A.D. Coleman of photography from uh, New York Times, Village Voice, and, and the art historian passed away, uh, Arthur C. Danto or the uh, reviewers. Homework is another book that is uh, here, which, which uh, are, are a collection of all the photographs that I've made in Finland. And uh, then there's this one, which, which uh, you know, was lucky to win the uh, German uh, photo book prize best monograph of the year 2019-20, that's how they describe it. Um, and uh, it looks like like this without the labels on it. It's a heavy 330 page, 260 images uh, with, with essays uh, by, here's the opener with that picture of the mirror. Uh, it's in duotone, no, it's in tritones rather, and, and very beautifully printed. Uh, and the, the essays, uh, this is uh, by Vicki Goldberg. Uh, and then there's one with uh, uh, Keith F. Davis, uh, Being Within the World, uh, its title. Uh, the book opening was in Paris. Uh, the chapters I've written, uh, this one is The Inventor of Trees. I don't think we talked about that picture, but it, uh, yeah, it's there. And, and this one with the uh, Shelton Tower that we mentioned, uh, I get the numbers right, yeah, 270 tritones, stories galore. Uh, and it's a book I'll be bringing a copy of and, 
and it's one that you know if you, if you are interested well, of course we can talk about how to, how to satisfy that uh 30 american states uh 30 countries around the world we spoke about that the the way pictures play off of each other from decades apart we've had this kind of snow just recently actually um and the back cover so to conclude uh, on on my work you know here's a one of the classic pictures made in 2000 writing on water and we come back to the themes that we always have i believe if we're looking for longevity and you're looking at photography as a way of of holding people's interest and building an audience that comes to understand how you think or if you're a poet like billy collins you could pick his poetry out a mile away um and so i've been in my Oh, you know, you could say, okay, I'm an old man, but I'm really not. You should judge it by, by the pictures I make. Um, the, um, but 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 I'm I'm reaching to you know, end of life things. I'm sure, you know, these trees falling in the, <laughs> trying to lift them up, pick them up. You know, uh, I don't know what that represents, but it's uh, kind of a water spider that's still trying to make it reaching for, for uh, infinity. Or this one, which I made yesterday, uh, testing, testing the waters. Uh, uh, and the very next image after that is a variant, which is the image I was going after. But I got this one first and uh, really love it. The quietness of it and the profoundness of it. Uh, you know, my, my camera, I'm out pretty far. Uh, and my camera's in another location. And I, at that moment, the, the panic kind of stepped in when I started to think about how would I, if I fell in, how would I get my camera? And this is the image that, that uh, I was after. Uh, and I call it a prayer for the planet. Uh, I see that my work, ultimately the best of it, uh, will probably speak to the climate, the planet, and, and our relationships to others foremost. Why workshops work? These are, these are images made from, uh, and there's, I think there are two sets of these, yeah. Of, of, the, of the students with whom I have worked. And I'd, I'd like to just introduce a few of these to you. You can see down at the end, there's a, the end, that's where I think we're headed in this presentation. And I thank, you know, Kevin, thank you. And I thank, uh, of course, Brandon and, and, and Peter and, and the whole staff at, at the uh, LACP. I'm looking forward to being there with you. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions via the uh, workshops or, or the, uh, the center. Uh, if you feed them to, to uh, Brandon, uh, I, can, I can answer them. Um, so let's look at some of these pictures. This, these are, this is a group of my students from 1974 in Finland. Photo one, my first classes I was teaching after graduating from with a, my MFA at Rhode Island School of Design. That's what I looked like. And these are some of the, you know, we were doing, you know, everything in trays, no gloves. We, you know, doing archival methods here. We're not we're thinking about the health measures, but, but in any case, uh, this is later when I was teaching at MIT for, I was there for four years in the creative photography gallery uh, lab uh, at Minor Whitehead Institute. Um, and we started a master of science and visual studies and invited uh, two uh, guest lecturers to come for three weeks each during that first year. Uh, the first of them was the man standing on your left, uh, or yeah, on the left, and that's Robert Frank. Uh, uh, I don't have a picture of Lee Friedlander, who was the second one, but just thought I'd throw that. Uh, while I was teaching there, I did a thing called Stop and Shoot, which we can try on a Wednesday. 
uh, well, we have three days only, so we may have to, I may have to give you this assignment as a personal assignment. But the idea is you flip a coin uh, to tell you in which direction you go. Then you flip the coin again uh, to tell you how many miles you go, uh, if you're running or, or if you're driving or biking. Uh, then uh, a third coin is flipped to um, uh, how long you stay in that spot. And so if everybody's doing the same thing, you can't imagine, you can't imagine how different all the works are. You know, for some people, you know, you do five or six, you, you do a, about a day with this thing. And we'd have like seven or eight cars. It, 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 this is UMass Lowell, where we would, we would do that. This is MIT here, but, uh, and sometimes, you know, you, you have a six or seven cars and there's a red light. So I, I just go through the red light. Everybody follows me because people think it's a funeral. Uh, or sometimes people get out of their front yards and think a highway is going in with so many photographers around. People love it. And so do the students, they create some great works. I'm a looker at, at student work. I, I, these are some of mine actually, but I, I spend time with individual images uh, a great deal. I write about them all the time, other people's work. These are my Swiss students. Uh, in, in uh, Veve, where I taught for 10 years on off uh, season uh, semester breaks. Uh, I always had the first year class, uh, met with them three times a year, and then a new class would come through. And then while I was at UMass Lowell, I, I developed uh, together with uh, my colleague, Pima Loxon, in a, uh, uh, in a, a travel workshop with 10, uh, in this case, it was 10 uh, of my American students, 10 of my Swiss students, and 10 of my Finnish students. And we went in this first, it's called spirit level. And the first spirit level, we, we started out in Finland, everybody went there and, and, and with an express bus, went to uh, St. Petersburg from Finland, down from there to Estonia, into Poland, into uh, Czech Republic, uh, down all the way into Switzerland, where we developed all the work. It was a three week, 30 student extravaganza. It was so good, we had to had, I had to do it again. This is uh, the whole group in St. Petersburg uh, near the uh, Hermitage. We developed an exhibition also with these, uh, so the student work could be shown to the general public uh, in each of the institutions. The spirit level went all the way up to five different uh, groupings. Uh, there are a few more coming up. This is my workshop students in, in Maine. Uh, uh, this is another spirit level, the second one where we went to uh, Tuscany. We're in Siena right here, all different students, this time also Finns and Swiss. And uh, we stayed with the Toscana Photographic Workshops group, one of the Primo, primo, yeah, primo uh, workshop experiences in, 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 in the world uh, uh, with great teachers. And, and, and uh, Carlo Roberti is the uh, founder and director, and he runs a great ship. Uh, this is in Norway uh, for another organization. Uh, uh, and uh, this is in China uh, with these group, this group. Uh, you eat at these tables that have a kind of a circular uh, table. You spin this thing. That, well, you all know that. But you can see, I, you know, I'm a Neil Young fan. Maybe that matters. Uh, so spirit level, this is when we're in Finland. Uh, this is the, uh, when we went to Mexico. Uh, at that point, we developed that we made a little book. I'm going to try to bring that book with me because maybe it's something that the center would be interested in, maybe starting to, to publish something like that. I have to be reminded of that though. Again, uh, from, from Finland, uh, this is in France. I was uh, asked to be the teacher over a period of time in New York for the, the Young Photography Festival, something that was intended for, for students, uh, unlike R, which is for the professional. Uh, this is at the end after we had the big opening and maybe there was some champagne, so it got to our heads. This is in Moscow uh, with the group. And again, you know, where my feelings, you know, Russians are great people, Americans are great people, everybody, 
We're all great people. So third spirit level went to back to Italy, but this time to, to Florence. And with the, uh, this time with a, uh, uh, the Italian school, the Finnish school and the American school. So it, it, it changed. And then there was one more, but I jump here to the one where we went. Uh, we invited the, a French school where I had taught and, and a Norwegian school where I had taught and my American students and we all went from, uh, you, we invited the Europeans to come to America. And so we left from UMass Lowell in, near Boston and headed to the George Eastman house and had a great tour there. And then would stop and shoots all the time coming down all the way to Lexington, Virginia to visit with Sally Mann for about two, two and a half days. Uh, and it was just a spectacular experience with the students. After that, we drove back up to see her show in New York and other shows in, in Chelsea and uptown and, and then from there to RISD and back to Lowell. Uh, these are the Norwegian students when they first arrived and their teacher Inge Helland. Uh, it was three uh, uh, enterprise uh, vans that drove us all around. And I took my little Mini Cooper convertible uh, uh, and uh, during the drive, I would, I would continue the conversations with each of the students and always took a picture of them sitting next to me. The, the pers person petting a dog there, of course, is Sally. Uh, a few of the teachers are there, Inge on the left, and Shahel is Hegner here with the camera. Uh, there are the vans here, an American, a French, uh, uh, an American, a Norwegian, and a Norwegian, and a French. So, you know, two of each. I was looking back there because I couldn't see her, uh, Jenna. And then when we all came back to UMass Low, that's what we looked like. It looks like I'm uh, the tallest in the room. Uh, no, there's another guy there, Gregor. Um, the, this is uh, in Brazil, uh, where the, the, the exhibition with the, the big mural was. I also did a workshop there. and. Uh, the uh, the guy with the red shoes is uh, is Joao. He's the uh, director of the program, the curator. And finally, uh, a major opportunity to teach in, in four universities in Germany. A major exhibition that they held for the students at the Museum of uh, Modern Art in Frankfurt. The show is called Nexus. I wrote a paragraph for everyone that we made a nice little brochure of that a terrific uh, exhibition that you saw before and this uh, you know this wasn't during covid uh, this was during during the time i had a cold i had these eyeglasses that had flashlights on it and so i couldn't speak at all i lost my voice completely and we had you know it was a three-day workshop for about four three days about the same length we're gonna have and so what we did is, uh, they, you know, this was in Kyoto in Japan. Uh, they gave, they uh, gave a, uh, you know, I, the, even the microphone didn't work, but we, we projected on the screen after the works were shown, we projected my writings. So I wrote about everyone, uh, I don't know, it was 40 pages or something like that, uh, about my thoughts, about the questions that rose, and I sent this to everyone afterwards. So these were the, the venues. Uh, that's the, the end of this thing. And I close uh, with, with my thanks to, again, to the center for allowing me to finish the, the what was supposed to be an hour <laughs> long lecture. Uh, and uh, I, I can't wait to be there and uh, to, to meet each of you and uh, work, work with you.